Global recovery is on an upswing, but equities don't seem all that enthused. So our rising yields, interest rates, uh, drowning out some of the liquidity and geopolitical, and whether the geopolitical tension playing out on the mind of investors as well. So many moving parts. Let's get somebody who tracks all of this and still makes an investment. And somebody who's been managing funds for more than 20 years, really. Shiv Puri, the founder and managing director of TVF Capital Advisors, joins us from the Singapore studios of Bloomberg. Shiv, so good having you. Thank you so much for taking the time out. Um, how, does, how does the remainder of 2018, or maybe even how does 2018 as a whole uh, seem to you? Would it be a year that could be marked by earnings growth? but compression of multiples, which could well make uh, making returns a lot more difficult for fund managers like yourselves or for individual investors. Yeah, I think Neeraj, you said it right. Uh, this year we've seen from the start of the year uh, two countervailing forces. You've got a macro that's worsening globally, and you've got a micro in India that is improving quite nicely. Um, you know, as we see them, the results season, uh, earnings have broadened quite well for most in the, uh, companies across industries. And really, if you, if you got into the year with a good balance sheet, uh, your business is doing fine, uh, pretty much across industries. Uh, and that's something we're seeing for the first time uh, this year. So you've got, you know, significantly high oil prices, interest rates that are certainly going up, inflation that's... Uh, coming on quite strongly, and I think will probably surprise on the upside in the Western world uh, this year for the first time. Uh, and along with that, uh, on the other side, at least in India, you're seeing pretty healthy earnings growth. So I think the net of the two is uh, exactly what you're saying, which is multiple compression, but rising earnings, uh, which makes uh, individual selection all the more important. So, but w what do you think, Shiv, will emerge triumphant? Would the earnings growth uh, come out trumps or do you believe the compression will be strong enough to ensure that even if there is earnings growth, save for a select few pockets, uh, the markets would net net give out disappointing returns, not compared to 2017, but just in absolute terms? Yeah, I think in absolute terms over the next 12 months, uh, there's not much to expect from the market. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that's happening on the macro uh, that we don't know how it's going to play out. Uh, at the global level, obviously, you've seen uh, the opposite of quanti quantitative easing taking place on a monthly basis, uh, with the U.S. buying, U.S. Fed buying less, uh, uh, you know, less of the less bonds. Uh, we're seeing rising interest rates for the first time after seven or eight or ten years. Um, you know, we've obviously have some element of political uncertainty in India. So I think the net of it, the market is is not going to be very strong for the for the next 12 months. It actually follows the cycle as well. If you see 2014 was a good year and 15, 16, nothing much happened. 17 was a good year. And it's likely that this year will, will be a more of a pause. Um, Shiv, so there are, there are probably two ways to invest then, right? I mean, one is you invest for the really short term. And, and maybe certain fund managers have the compulsion of showing that uh, uh, growth year after year. Or in certain cases where investors are in understanding enough, you invest not for the now and current, but maybe uh, from a two-year, three-year perspective. What are you doing right now, and where is it that you're finding pockets to invest to suit your investing style? I think one of the important things that's emerging is uh, when you're investing for the long term is to understand the role of technology disruption that's happening globally. Uh, and it's happening at a very rapid pace. You know, I spent a week in January at uh, Singularity University in Cupertino, and you know, some of the things that you saw were, uh, you know, that I thought were far out in the future and weren't going to be commercialized are actually happening at a very rapid pace in the commercial sector. So when we look at that, the implications of businesses in India uh, are also going to come roll out over the next couple of years. And I think more than worrying about the short term of the next three or six months, how the market ends, one has to look and see, are the businesses that, uh, uh, that are there, are they going to benefit from this technology change? Or on the other hand, are they going to get rapidly hurt? And I think that's the most important distinction investors need to make today. Okay, so where, where, where do you believe 
uh, or what pockets do you believe will get rapidly hurt? If, if I can start off with the words of caution first before I move on to what pockets are looking interesting. <laughs> So, you know, the, the dis disruption uh, areas in India are quite a few that are going to get hurt. I mean, for example, you know, if you look at the cost of where solar power is today, at two and a half or three rupees per kilowatt, uh, you know, what happens to all these assets that are coal and thermal based? Uh, you know, they're not as economically viable uh, as before. And then you take that a step further. What happens to all the companies that supply goods into those spaces, you know, the boiler companies, the turbine companies, things like that. There's a real challenge that they would face. Uh, we're seeing that happen in the media space, you know, with uh, 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 Geo coming in and, and having data at such a low uh, cost, uh, which is great for the consumer, and a lot of media is being consumed that way. Um, you're also seeing uh, the broadcast uh, companies having to invest more in creating content. Um, so margins there will compress. Uh, as you're seeing advertising move more towards digital. And uh, you know these are countervailing forces for companies that will uh, become quite real in the years to come. Yeah, well, um, I can uh, say, I can uh, agree with one point on that for sure, Shiv. Uh, we are just a digital-only product, and we are already seeing some bit of migration there, and happily so. So yeah, yeah, yeah that, that, that seems to be working out that way. Um, OK, let's try and uh, focus on, uh, OK, maybe one follow-up question really on this whole power situation that you said now. You know, if, if you hear so many of these, I'm forgetting the gentleman's name, but on, on, on YouTube, there is this whole presentation by this gentleman who's talking about this falling cost of solar power or renewable energy and the impact that it could have on, on, on conventional modes of power. Uh, now, these are dead horses almost, right, Shiv? Uh, you can't beat a dead horse down further. So, therefore, my question to you would be, are you then recommending that uh, companies in the thermal power segment or, or companies with supply components to the thermal power segment, uh, they may not be sells, but they are definitely not buys, no matter what the valuations are. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, it's uh, very difficult to pinpoint valuations of companies whose future is highly uncertain. Uh, okay. There's almost no price that gives you that level of comfort because you don't know how steep the cliff can be. Um, so, you know, while this could be something in India that plays out over a longer period of time and therefore if the valuations are cheap, uh, you know, they might look uh, sensible, but it's a very difficult game to get right. Yeah, I guess so. so uh, you know, interlinked to this pocket or these pockets, Shiv, uh, because these are capital intensive projects, are the financiers of these projects. Now, there is hope that at some point of time, uh, some of the monies that have been invested into these projects might might see some returns. Uh, what happens there? Uh, do you believe that these those are lost causes as well? Well, uh, you know, it, it depends on, w on which specific project, whether it's operational, what sort of PLF it's operating at. But if you look at the state-run uh, banks, uh, the biggest source of uh, problems that are emerging now is the power sector. They've taken down all the recognition on infrastructure and the other areas, uh, but power is where uh, the pain is, is uh, still ongoing. Uh, that's true. Okay, uh, let, let's, let's dwell a bit on uh, the financial space there. I mean, I, you know, if I look at your holdings as well, at least the ones that are available on a terminal, you are betting in a reasonable way on some of the financiers. You know, so many people tell me about the lending super cycle that we are already in, or maybe amidst at uh, the household debt to GDP ratio for India compared to the EM market, Korea, or any of the others, so low that people will borrow more, and therefore all financiers which manage their books well will do well. Do you subscribe to this thought? And if so, it's such a big bucket. Where is it that you think the winners will emerge from? Yeah, so, you know, uh, financial services in India have got two components. One is the underpenetration, what you're talking about, which, which has a ways to go. But the second is also the market share shift, uh, which still has also a long way to go. So it's a combination of uh, those, two, those two things that will play out. The important thing, I think in India is to realize that the private sector banks and some of the financial services companies, the well-run ones, are in a wonderful position structurally. And it's not because their balance sheets are good and they're taking share from the state-run banks who have NPA issues, that's, we all know. But also because from a, in a world where technology is gonna get more and more valuable, 
uh, and I've been saying this for a while, the delta between them uh, and the state-run banks is only going to widen. And it's very interesting. In India, one of the, I think, very sensible things that have happened is that the government has opened the digital platform, right, with the UPI, uh, and they've developed apps on that, like Beam. Uh, we obviously have the, 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 the mobility, mobility uh, penetration rate that's already there. And private sector banks are the ones that are sitting on the data of consumers. This is very different than the China model, uh, which I've uh, seen at very close quarters, uh, where you have two payment companies that control the data, that control the transactions, and have all the history. Um, so in, in, in the context of India, I think these are, these are the uh, companies in the private sector space um, that have the huge advantage. Now they have to leverage it, and they have to be doing things. And I think some of them are doing that very well. Interesting. Uh, you may not be at the liberty to name uh, stocks, so please feel free to not do that. But and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but if I look at your holding Shiv, you don't have uh, too many large private sector banks, right? I mean, you have holdings in City Union, Repco, Bharat Financial, which are not necessarily the A-list, so to say. Uh, how is it that then you've chosen the kind of bets that you've chosen? When you're talking about how it's the private sector banks, etc., which seem to be at the forefront of this revolution, if I can use that term. Well, like I said, yeah, you're right. I can't uh, name any names, uh, but I'll say that the list is uh, very dated. Uh, and uh, if I if I look at some of the larger private sector banks today, uh, they are in an unusually good position uh, <laughs> because they have, first of all, world class management teams. Uh, if you look at some of the statements that are coming out of the, some of the well-run companies, and you see their behavior, you have CEOs spending time, you know, weeks uh, uh, in a year in Silicon Valley, and they are attracting some of the talent from there. Uh, you know, there's a big private sector bank that has a large incubation uh, uh, set up in Bangalore, uh, where they are incubating 30 or 40 companies. They're really thinking uh, of how to partner with these companies in the fintech space. And these companies in the fintech space also realize they need the customers of the banks. They're not going to be able to get them uh, like they did in China. Um, so these, these guys are in unusually well positioned. And you know, some of the results are already starting to show. I mean, if you look at the cost to income ratio of these banks of the last four years, uh, they've gone down quite dramatically. And I think there's a lot more that's going to come on that front. Interesting. My final question, Shiv. Uh, you spoke about how a couple of uh, large companies in China uh, dominate one aspect of the financial services space, if I heard, if I understood you correctly. Uh, that seems to be the case that could happen in India in the retail space, right? With, with the latest uh, move that's happened and the large deal, Indian online retail at least will be dominated by two major players. Uh, at least seems to be the case. Have you, have you looked at the Indian retail space, both offline and online, and who do you think will emerge triumphant over the next four or five years? Are you betting on this space at all? Uh, you know, it's interesting. I mean, India is one of the unique markets where you've got the equivalent of uh, a Walmart and an Amazon coming up at the same time. You know, in, in the U.S., what happened, you had, you know, mom and pop retail move to organized big, uh, big house retail, uh, discount retail like, like Walmart did. And then, you know, after a number of years, Amazon came. Whereas in India, the organized retailing industry, the brick and mortar industry itself is very young. So you've got both these models that are coming up simultaneously. And in the context of India, I think both have their place. And they both have a, some uh, advantages. So I'm not so sure it'll play out like the US, where you know, the entire uh, market, like you said, has moved online. Uh, I think there's an opportunity here for both, both sides. Are you betting on offline retail in India? No, we have, uh, we have no interest in, in that space yet. Okay, fair call. Uh, Shiv, understand we have to thank you, uh, but it was a pleasure chatting with you, and do look us up when you are in India uh, next. But thanks so much for taking the time out and speaking to us today.